Sam Tekel Wright, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, before we get into it, someone joked the other day and said, is your middle name really Tech Girl? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what my parents named me when I was born. <laughs> no, do you have a middle name? Michelle, actually. Okay, Sam Michelle, right. Okay, cool. But thanks for coming on the show. I'm I'm a fan, I must be honest. I, I've got to know you over the, the last few sort of years as we've uh, interacted, but I'm, I'm a big fan. I think you've done an amazing job so far. You must be chuffed, though, with how far you've come. I mean, sometimes when I don't have to wake up before 8 in the morning, I'm like, oh, that's a pretty cool job. And then other days when I'm working a 12-hour shift, I'm like, this sucks. But <laughs> I am pretty I'm, – I'm stoked that I got to build something from my passion. I yeah. think that's the biggest thing. And I don't think I'm very good with authority, so not having, like, a dedicated boss – Works quite well for me. So, yeah, I'm yeah, So, you're I'm not happy. a nine to five kind of person when it comes to the office. Have you ever had a real job before? A real job. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? All, I mean, all due respect, obviously, to the craft, but I'm saying, have you ever had, like, have you worked in a bank? Or? I mean, I worked in an advertising agency. Okay. Uh, and I did that whole thing where you have to be in, and I never understood it because I'm one of these people, like, I can do more in a morning than I think most people can do in three days. But after like two o'clock, don't ask me to do anything. Like I, that's when I want to play games or whatever. So for me, working in an office environment was horrible because I'd get so much done. And yeah. then in the afternoon, be I didn't want to work. Or like I didn't like people talking to me. If I'm feeling like productive, having meetings, I just didn't cope well. And then I didn't cope well with people telling me what I could and couldn't do because I just decided I knew best. You know, I'd look at finances and be like, that's not going to work. <laughs> so I used to butt heads a lot. Okay. And then I left. But Sam, the KPIs. You know, I can't and all of that like the, the ridiculous speak and having to dress a certain way yeah. like I it just didn't suit my personality I think I need a little bit of chaos all the time and that's why I like what I do because it just changes all the time it's not that same like go to the office put your laptop down and off you go yeah yeah uh, I mean also there's no time for gaming and that's the biggest thing all there was there was always in, time in all for gaming. seriousness though you, when you're doing a nine to five you get home you're knackered I suppose gaming I suppose late hours um uh, you play till two in the morning. You don't eat properly. You're super <laughs> unhealthy. You wake up feeling rubbish. You sit in traffic and hate your life. Yeah. Then you get really angry in the evenings with, with other people and shout at them on the internet. I mean, <laughs> perfect life. No, but there isn't. And that's the thing. You yeah. become, I feel like I was living to work versus working to live, yeah. which I still do now, but I like my job. So it's different. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about it because I think for me, you come across as someone who's so comfortable in their own skin. Like you've you found that sweet spot, like everything is just flowing and it's fluid and it just feels good. Is that fair? I think now it is. This yeah. year, uh, I've been doing this for like five years and I think in the beginning it wasn't like this. In the beginning, this wasn't a job. This was, it was something I was doing for fun and then people said, oh, you can turn this into a job. And then everyone had an opinion of, of how it needs to be done because in South Africa, esports wasn't that popular. Yeah. It wasn't really a career path. Everyone was very keen to give me advice and you take it all on and you listen. And then I, I started going overseas and I was listening to a million other people tell me things. And I I constantly was trying to fit into these boxes mm -hmm. that everyone said and it wasn't working. And, and I felt uncomfortable and I wasn't sure. And then I think towards the end of last year, I kind of was like, you know what, you're reaching a point where I know what I want in terms of where I want to go with my career. I know what I, the changes I want to make within the industry. I don't care what anyone says anymore. I'm just going to do this my way. And if it, if it crashes and burns... I'll find that office job and I'll suck it up. And that, I think, was the big change. But I think that's with anyone. They, they'll they tell you, like, it takes you a couple of years to find your feet. And then once you do, you're comfortable. And now I think I've had the best year of my career this year. And I just think it's because I kind of went, I'm just going to do this my way. Yeah. And if you don't like it, unfortunately, is what it is. It might be wrong and I'll learn from it, but I'd rather do that. And I think that that's, a, that's an important step for anyone is to kind of go, it's all right to mm. just be yourself. If you make mistakes, that's on you but you don't have to try and fit into the box that everyone tells you to. Yeah, I think that's what interesting for me is I've had a similar thing and maybe it's because we've been in the sort of content industry for a while, you know, in various sort of ways, but you get to a point where it's like, I need to have fun. I need to enjoy. I need to get out of bed, get the cup of coffee in hand and, and be ready to go. You know, I don't want to be dreading having to go through the office doors. I've been very fortunate to have some cool gigs over the past, but I'm now at a space where I'm just having fun and going with the flow because I think when you do let go, things tend to happen for you, you know? 
I think so. And also for me, I mean, esports is interesting because people think, I mean, I do literally just sit and talk about other people playing video games, which is sick, but they forget that there is a camera, there's people shouting in your ears. You, I'm not, I wasn't a girl that wanted to be in front of the camera. I'm not a girly girl. So like dressing up in makeup makes me feel very uncomfortable. So when you're sitting in front of camera and you've got this face of makeup and you're wearing this dress and these newsreader heels, <laughs> I used to feel horrific. And this year I went, you know what, I'm not doing that anymore. Like yeah. we play games, for goodness sakes, why are we dressing like newsreaders? So the um, full on ball gown sort of vibe. I've done the ball gown. You're I've been kidding. put in a ball gown. Because this was like a weird thing where they were like, we want you to look like a sportscaster. And that's cool, but... I've reached a point now where I'm like, no, we play games. I'm going to wear jeans. I'm yeah. going to wear my sneakers. And I think changing that made me feel more comfortable. Okay. I'm more comfortable. I'm better at my job. I'm not worrying about whether I feel comfortable in what I'm wearing, trying to figure out how I'm going to stand. I just was like, I'm going to look the way I want. I'm going to talk the way I want. Because we all play games at the end of the yeah. day. We don't have to be these. Because that was the thing, I think, with esports. They try to make everyone like these super serious. I always said it wasn't even like sports commentators. It was like news readers. Yeah. And I just went, that's stupid. Like, no no one playing games talks like that. Yeah. And now that I've kind of been able to do my own thing, and like you said, have fun. Now it feels like fun when I go to work. It's a 12-hour day, but I feel like I'm just sitting with my mates talking about games, which is what it's supposed to be. Yeah. So and it just, feels good to, to tick off the end of the day with whatever your beverage is, and you're going, damn, man, I had fun today. I did something the, cool. I've just come off a job, which was it's a, the biggest the biggest esports event for a game called Counter-Strike is the major, and it's happening in Rio this year. And I got to do the North American and South American qualifiers in Sweden. Awesome. And there's a team called Imperial, and there's, there's these players in Imperial who, they have this incredible story where they played, they were from Brazil. Brazil didn't even have servers for Counter-Strike. They couldn't speak a word of English. These five guys, they moved to North America, live in a two-bedroom apartment, are working at like McDonald's, can't speak English because they want to play Counter-Strike. They end up becoming the best in the world. They win like two majors. They're these superstars. They're now at the end of their career. They want to go home to Rio to play the major, but they have to qualify. They haven't qualified. It's the last game of like five days, and they're going to now play this game. And if they lose, that's it. They're retiring never again. If they win, they go home to Rio to retire. And that was my job. I get to like tell the story. Oh, man. It's like a six hour day. When that when that game finished, I was bouncing off the walls. I was like, this is the best job in the world <laughs> because it was so much fun yeah. getting to watch them. They, they went to overtime and then they finally won it. They're crying. You're there. That's when you take a look back. And you're like, this is cool. Like I got to tell that story. I'm part of history. And hot damn, my job is awesome. But I think there's been other times with, especially in esports, where I've done a job and at the end of it, I've been so concerned about fitting into a box and doing it this way that the job ends and you, instead of being like, this is so rad, you're, you're ending it going, I'm just glad that's over. Like, let's move on. So I think it's important to kind of find yourself a little bit, yeah. like you said. I think esports is a fascinating topic for me. And I know it's obviously <laughs> part of your DNA now. But when you got into esports as a shoutcaster, I mean, there must have been times when you were like, what am I doing here? You know, especially now that you've told me that people were trying to put you in boxes, high heels, dresses, that sort of thing. Because the eSports broadcast model is not the same as an NFL game, as a rugby game, as a cricket match. It's different because it's a different lingo. It's, it's different action, you know. Um, when you first started off, did you question, you know, getting into this and, and, and what you were doing? Or was there still that burning desire to succeed at this? I mean, when I got into it, I didn't even think it was a job. So I just got frustrated because I felt like there were these esports players running around South Africa and there would be like a big launch event and all the media would be there for the day and then just disappear and everyone forgot about them. And one of my friends was so excited the one day about this event we were at where there was like some free alcohol and food and he was jumping around being like, this is it, esports has made it. And I was like, nah, it hasn't. <laughs> And then I felt bad. So I was like, oh, I'll just make some content. Started making content. And the first job I got was a very big job at Rage. But I knew when they came to me, because the worst is they didn't even hide it. They said, oh, we need a woman. That was it. That no one said, can you do this? Are you capable? Have you ever walked on a stage with a microphone? Have you ever worn an in-ear? Spoiler, I hadn't. I had no idea. They just went, oh, we, we need a girl in gaming. You're a girl in gaming. You can do this. <laughs> And like, I think for me, when I first started, that was something that I just, I had a bit of an imposter syndrome because every time I got a job, I was like, oh, they're just hiring me because they need the, I mean, it's a really crude statement, but the token vagina, that was how I felt. Sure. And then it would be like, you must wear this dress and you must wear these heels. And I was like, this is, you don't really care what I say, yeah, like yeah. this is a, a particular thing. So I think coming into it, that was really tough. And it was very much like, this is the mold because there weren't a lot of women in the scene and there was no women in South Africa. Overseas, there was a few mm. and they kind of went, cool, look like them, do them. But obviously that's not how it works. So yeah. in the beginning, there was a lot of 
I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this because it's fun and I want to do it. But at the back of my head going, you know, does anyone does anyone actually care what I have to say? Am I only getting hired because of this? But I think that's a struggle that anyone has. So it was kind of how I started just having to fight those demons that yeah. were in my head. And fast forward now, you you mean you're on the biggest stages. You, you, you're a shoutcast internationally. I mean, you know, that sort of imposter syndrome is now long gone because you're a leading shoutcaster in, in the in this esports world. I mean, I don't think it's gone. We were actually talking about, <laughs> I mean, it's still there. Like there's still, but it's a different concern. I mean, I also know I'm not stupid. I think my gender has helped me open doors for me. Um, and, and there's a push for diversity. Mm. So there has been doors that have been open for me, which maybe wouldn't have been if I wasn't a woman. Sure. I've just chosen to step through them and do the best possible job. I'm, I'm never, ever down. It's been a great that. job, by the way. Thank you. No, I, I, seriously, it, it's, I know what you're saying, but it, you've also worked extremely hard. You know what the games are about. You know the strategies. You know how to capture the moment. You know how to tell the stories. So you've earned your stripes in this craft. So sorry, I interrupted you there, but I'm just saying like, no ways, man. You, you're doing an excellent it. job. Keep it up. But I do think sometimes I'll go, like now I get to work with, and this is where the weird change happens. So now I get to work with players that one I watched for years. So they were like my heroes. I'm a fan first and foremost, especially internationally in South Africa. I was watching them on Twitch and these are my heroes. So when you walk into a room and your hero is there, you're like, what, what am I shouldn't be here? Crazy, this is yeah. crazy. And then I work with broadcast talents who I watched before I even decided this was a job. They were people that entertained me. So now when you, you walk into a set and you're looking at them going, I, I've been watching you for like 10 years. This is this is like you are here next to me now. What what the hell am I doing here? Then I get a little bit of like that that weird, yeah. I, I wouldn't even call it imposter syndrome. I think it's just this complete like don't stuff this up because you'll make them look bad type of feeling okay. uh, that hits. But I spoke to, the, there's a gent that's been in esports for, for years and he's incredible. And I, I spoke to him about it and I said, you know, like I really struggle sometimes when it's, when it is like one of these big names with me, I freak out. And he was like, well, the day you don't, it's probably the day you should quit because then you don't care about the job you're doing. And that's kind of stuck with me because yeah. he was like, if you're not nervous and you're not going, I'm scared, I'm going to mess up, you probably are done with this career. So that's helped me a bit. But okay. So there's I still, still a few nerves. All the time. Yeah. All the it's time. It's healthy. It's healthy. Trust me. Even me, like I've been fortunate to do this a long time. And I know when that camera light pops red, it's game on. And there are a little bit of butterflies, but it's... It's a healthy space to be in. So I, I think it's it's great to hear because you're still extremely humble. You know what I mean? You know that you've earned your spot on the broadcast, but you're still willing to learn and, and take an advice because I think if you don't, also, it is time to quit. 100%. I think if, and also, I mean, I've worked with people now who aren't willing to take advice and who think they know best and you can see that it's, it's coming to an end. I think that's the... The best part about any job is you just you constantly learn, you constantly find new ways to do things. Like I'm really comfortable where I am now in my skin and, and how I present, but I know in like three months' time I'm going to change something. I was I was at a drifting event and I saw an MC called Victor Pardell, who I've known because we grew up in the south of Joburg together. Good, good part of the world. Good part of the world. I mean, when I was like 19, <laughs> I think he took me drifting. I actually shouldn't say this. Drifting around some circles near the Glen Shopping Center. So like he was my first introduction into cars. And he obviously got into the MC space from a motoring point of view. And I watched him at a big event recently and I was like, I'm going to use, like, Vic has this incredible energy where he jumps around and he's dancing and he's he's quite, like, loud and he connects with the crowd well. And I went, I want that. Like, I want, I can't take all of that because that's yeah. a bit too loud for what I do, but I'm going to steal some of that and try implement it into what I, into my presenting style. So I think you're constantly learning and mm. trying to develop because we're storytellers at the end of yeah. the day. So we just want to tell the best possible story. So if we can take little elements and, and constantly improve the way we narrate that story, it's more exciting for the people watching, which is ultimately what we want to do. I completely agree. Uh, and, th and that brings me to my next question because you've also transitioned. I mean, like streaming on Twitch, right? That You also learn to broadcast, you know, in, in a way because you are talking to an audience, you're having fun, you're playing games. Uh, how much did that help on your broadcasting and, and sh you know, commentary journey? So interesting enough, I wouldn't say the streaming helped. Uh, the streaming I struggle with actually a lot of the time because you have to engage <laughs> with a chat live. Do you know what helps? I used to sit and watch these YouTube videos. Of this oh, I can't even remember. He was this old, old dude from the BBC who used to talk about like broadcasting 101, okay. like the super traditional, like step by step. I'm sure they teach it at every like school you go to. <laughs> and I used to watch him and I'd write down all the stuff he said. 
And then I would try use that on my Twitch streams to okay. see if it helped. Some of it doesn't, and I threw it away because it was just really old fashioned. And and I think his his videos were so old that it was more like there's no engagement with the audience. Yeah. But some of his stuff is really clever. So I started like taking on that, put it into my streams, see if the response is good. And then when you move on to broadcast, you know that that works. So take it with you. But I was some weird old dude from the BBC. <laughs> like that was that was my my mentor. I can't even remember his name now. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, it's always interesting to hear people's influence, you know, and, and I think the, the reason I ask you is because just before we, we started the show, you said about, you know, toxic gamers and that sort of thing. Do you have to behave on, on Twitch? You know, it's obviously different to when you, you commentating on an international broadcast, but when you're in your own space and you're on Twitch or on TikTok, as you were saying the other day, you have to behave a little bit or can you be yourself? So this is what's interesting because for some reason when I'm on like an esports broadcast, a Switch like flicks, I never swear. I've got terrible, ter my mom is horrified by the way, my language <laughs> off, off broadcast, every second word is a swear word. But for some reason, when I'm on a broadcast, I just know don't, don't swear. It just it's doesn't that happen. It's the old BBC guy. It's the old BBC He's guy in my job. head. <laughs> uh, but on Twitch, you can be a little bit more free, right? Mm. You can talk a little bit more, you're in your room, it's a bit more comfortable. But I was always like cognizant of the fact that I was streaming. Yeah. So I was always like being a little bit more careful. And I think also the chat changes that. So this was interesting because now I've tried streaming on TikTok, which I thought wouldn't work for me, but I was, I was like, no young kids want to watch me play. Jumped onto TikTok, but the chat was so young and cheeky that it started bringing out, because when I normally play when there's no stream, I'm, I'm, I know I'm terrible at the game, but I like to make sure that everyone gets told how rubbish they are instead. <laughs> so like, I'm a little bit competitive. Toxic. Yeah, I'm competitive yeah. and toxic, <laughs> but then I miss everything, can't shoot anything. So I shout yeah. at all my teammates, tell them how useless they are. Like I'm a little bit toxic and I know that. Okay. And I, that's just how it is. But everyone knows if they play with me, that's what they're going to get. But it's interesting because when I used to stream on Twitch, we would I wouldn't be that vocal and I would try to be a bit more, you know, like rein it in a bit. You sure. know, you're trying to present a different image. But on TikTok, because the chat is quite toxic and was like chirp, because a lot of the chat, people I don't even know were chirping me, but in a fun way, which is exactly the way it is when you're playing a game. Anyone who's played a multiplayer game, yeah. you're chirping each other, having a good time. The chat started doing that. I suddenly relaxed. There was no control on TikTok. It, uh, by the end of it, we realized that we'd forgotten we were streaming because obviously play with a crew who know we're on a stream, we have to behave. Yeah. And at one point we, we all were like, oh, maybe we should we should just wind <laughs> this back a little bit. So I think that there's a difference. If you watch, there's a lot of people on Twitch who are, they literally stream themselves 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. So you see everything. But I think for most people who are playing games, there is a level of either like over the top excitement, which isn't natural mm. or... They are trying to be a bit more controlled. Yeah, I think that's just how it goes. But what I'm starting to realize is if you're just yourself, that's normally the best way to, to engage with an audience. Uh, authenticity. I exactly. Know, I suppose, yeah. But sometimes you shouldn't be that toxic because yeah. it upsets people. So um, before I ask you if you consider yourself a sweat um, in certain games, um, are you more a private person? Like, do you once the camera's off, you shut it down sort of thing? I know like you create a lot of content on social media and that. But when you're in your space and with your people and circle of trust, are you quite a private person? Yes, I don't like, I mean, I, I don't like any of it online. Like, mm. I just think that like a lot of my stuff needs to be off. And I also think for me, what you see is who I am. Like mm. it is, that is my personality, but there's obviously a lot more to me, but I prefer to have, I always call it like the, the grounding, mm. where it's like, I, I think if my entire, I've got friends who they're online all the time and their entire life is online. I don't want that because I feel like you do need to be grounded yeah. to a certain degree because I think that you can get really in your head and think that you're more important than what oh, you are. Definitely. That sort of negative feedback loop. Oh, yeah. no, 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 100%. And social media does that. Exactly. So, and also like the constant need for engagement. So like my friends are not on the internet. They don't care about any of it. They think like, I don't think they think it's stupid. I think they think it's cool, but there's a part of them where they're like, they just, I'm Sam to them. So yeah. like the whole take all thing's actually funny. Like they laugh about it all the time. <laughs> so I like being away from yeah. that whole thing and just being like as private as I can. So I try not like, I'll film contents in my house, but you don't really ever see my bedroom and yeah, you don't yeah. see the people in my life that much. I'll bring my dog in because he's just really ugly and looks cool on camera. <laughs> but I do try and, <laughs> I do try and keep a little bit of me to me. But yeah. I also just because I think people especially online, they, they feel like they're entitled to lots of access yeah. to you. And I, 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 there's some stuff that you just got to keep to yourself, right? It's just for your own safe, like your own safety, but also just like your own sense of self. Yeah. And also because at one point the internet could just com completely collapse. And if your entire life is invested on that, it's an you're a little bit screwed. Point. <laughs> yeah. It's an excellent point you make. Have you had to deal with trolls and things like that over the past? Because um, I think everyone who sort of gets 
into that sort of space where they're a public figure, uh, they have to deal with the amount of criticism or trolling. How do you deal with that? Because for me, it's just about ignoring and disconnecting. Um, how do you deal with that? So in the beginning, lots of trolls and obviously being in a space that is very male dominated, yeah. like uh, girls always get a lot of grief the moment you come in. Um, in the beginning, I didn't handle it well. Like I would check every mean message and remember it and listen to what they said. Then I went into the ignore stage where I was like, just ignore it. Um, don't look at it. Now I've reached a point where I like to take um, like the mean things people tweet me or whatever and turn them into motivational posts because okay. it's really funny. So like one one person came into a, a broadcast recently and they said, I admire your bravery because if my forehead was as big as yours, I'd never put it on camera. <laughs> so I turned that into a motivational post and I put it on the wall because I was like, it's just a good reminder of like, how far I've come. That was my my thing. Okay. So like stuff like that. And like someone else just one day was like, stop talking, play game. So like I thought that looked really good as a poster. For sure. So that's like my new thing. Now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like that's how I deal with it. I just think like not everyone what we do uh, from my side, what I'm I'm an entertainer at the end of the day. So not everyone's gonna like you. Like I've worked with people who can't stand them on a broadcast, don't want to listen to them, don't think they're very good commentators. Phenomenal people. Yeah. Some of my closest friends think they're rubbish at their job they're not rubbish at their job it's just not my style yeah so i've kind of just come to the conclusion that i'm like people aren't gonna like you there's not a lot you can do about it i used to be desperate for yeah. everyone to like me but i've now just realized that's it's I'm, not sustainable it's not gonna work yeah exactly and I, and I just think it leads to more anxiety and stress you know at the end of the day you can't please everyone uh if you can please two out of ten people hey you know so exactly what? i think also what's interesting for me is you made an interesting point you know, most of the game is, uh, I know it's changing, but initially, I suppose, when you started, it was m very male-dominated, intensive, it was very chauvinistic, um, crude, toxic. Uh, you think a game like, okay, Warzone's a little bit different, but a lot of multiplayer games, it's, it's hardcore and intimidating for girls to get into. How do you transition now? Is it, do you feel it's getting better, or do you think more girls coming in and just owning the space? And so I think it's getting better. For me, I was a giant tomboy growing up, um, and I played with my brother and his friends. So the crude, toxic stuff, you just learn to like, I'm, I'm, I'm quite like, I think this is the difference. I'm quite like sassy, so I would fight back. So yeah. when someone's rude to me, I'd just be right rude back. I could give as good as I could take, or what, you know, all of that. But not all girls are like me, obviously. Not all people are like me. So yeah. they, they go into a game and it's that's terrifying and it really makes them feel rubbish. Like I'll go into a game and someone will say, like last night I had a really bad game. I don't think I hit a single thing. I think I shot around someone's head about 72 times. What are you times. playing, CSGO? I no. was playing Siege last night. Okay. I haven't played it in months. And I, I, I drew pictures around everyone and just kept getting <laughs> shot. And some random in the chat was like, because I was obviously being very vocal in the voice chat about why I was sucking and everyone else needed to be better. <laughs> and someone in the some someone on the team made a comment about, oh, you suck because you're a girl. And I was just like, probably, but can you please fix that? You know, like I'm, <laughs> I don't let it really get to me. Yeah, yeah. I think for a lot of other people, it's not even girls. I've seen it with guys. Like it's really tough. If you're, an, if you're an introvert and you're suddenly in a space where you have to communicate with strangers in like a high, it is a high stress environment yeah. sometimes. It's, it's tough. So I think a lot of women just backed out of it it was scary to go in and also because when you put a microphone in front of someone in a screen they think they can say whatever they want it's changing i think people don't stand for it as much anymore yeah. like i've seen a lot of i've been in lobbies where someone's been sexist or made a crude comment and someone else in the game has said hey listen actually no we're going to kick you we're not putting up with that yeah so there are and there are a lot more women being vocal about playing they were playing before so like now you read all the media reports they say oh more women are playing games no they were playing before they're just more comfortable saying okay. i play now because before there was like this weird stigma about it but it still has a long way to go because at the end of the day it is it's much like social media it's all anonymous so everyone can be as mean as they want and gaming because of the level of banter it can sometimes go too far yeah. i think um so if you're in a you know, you're playing a game where you're shooting each other in the head. Like people are going to be intense, intense yeah. you know? <laughs> so like that, that, it does go too far sometimes. Um, but for me, I've just, I don't care. I just laugh. Yeah. I can also laugh sometimes. Like when someone says, go back to the kitchen, like I don't, other girls get offended. I just laugh. I'm just like, yeah. okay, dude, whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, w with the, the sort of, growth of gaming it's just exploded and then the the battle royales like it's just insane like and i i get that there's toxicity a lot of the time um please help yourself to some water if you thanks tyler my technical producers helped us out here um 
I just get the feeling that there's always a barrier to entry because some girls tend to um, be in a position where they scared of getting criticism more than abuse type thing, but they want to be part of it because they see how fun gaming can be. How do you sort of get them into that, that space? How do you make them comfortable? Is it purely coming down to the group you're playing with and the experience that you're having? So I think there's like different elements here and I'm going to talk about the stuff no one ever talks about because th there's girls that want to get into gaming not because they want to game but because they've realized that there's like a benefit to them in some way. So they want to be the girl gamer. Either it's a, an attention craving thing or they think that there's money and you've seen them. They're, they're sort of the girls posing in their underwear holding their controllers on Instagram. And like, yeah. I mean, no judge to them. Hey? Yeah, I'm yeah. all about like you pay your rent however you want. Sure. But, but there is this sort of, there's that group. And then there's the the girls who are a little bit sweaty like me where we want to go in and you know maybe we suck but we want to shoot everyone in the head and yeah, we sure. want to you know we want to be part of the team and then i think there's girls in the middle who just they want to play it looks like fun yeah. and they come in and they they're immediately put into one of those boxes it's either you want to be the sweaty best player or you must be what they, they call them thoughts which is like such a horrible term but you know all like the thought a thought oh wow i'm not even going to explain it but or like a, a gamer girl you know and then they, oh, okay. so you get sexualized a little bit which you just want to play the game yeah. so it, it becomes this really difficult space and i think for those girls like you said as well they're terrified of being criticized because you do get you get a lot more grief if you're a girl and you mm. suck for some reason like you can play like i was mentioning last night i was getting so much grief i wasn't the worst player on the team but i was the girl so yeah. i get the worst time of it and I, I was also very vocal and shouting at everyone else but that's another story but <laughs> i think a lot of girls feel like okay cool i want to play games but i have to be really good at it yeah because there's this weird rumor that like girls suck at games, right? And I don't know where that That's came good. from. That was this is my next question, but yeah. carry I mean, on. This please. is where I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it started, but girls suck at games. So there's this weird thing that I think most women have when they start playing is I have to be better than the men. And I actually think this is like a war this is not even just games, like this is life where women feel that they have to like one up a man in order to like not even to, to prove themselves, but just to be welcome to the mm. group, if you like. So I do think that that puts a lot of girls off. Mm. I think the easiest way is you've just got to find a crew of people who don't care, yeah. like who just want to play games with you, which is hard uh, if, you, if you're if you an introvert and you don't have a lot of friends. Mm. But there's so many groups now. So we have like something called Discord, yeah. which is like a social media place where you can find all these different channels and, and join people. I have a Discord channel where like random people know that they can come and play. And we're pretty good about controlling that environment. So we know... I like to think over the last few years, we've grown a community of people where anyone can come. We've had people come in and have never played a game with us. We drag them in, laugh with them. Now one of them's like ranked platinum and really wow. good at it. And she, I mean, she started and she was terrible. Yeah. But we wanted to create a safe space for her to play and to meet other people. And there's lots of groups like that. But on the other side, there's also obviously lots of toxic groups. Yeah, yeah. But it really is just finding a group of friends um, and playing. And also you don't have to play multiplayer. If you just want to play a single player, no one ever needs to yeah, see how exactly. much you suck. You know? See, I'm a big campaign guy. The, I, I love campaigns. Time for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's an investment, 100%. But I've now, I am terrible, but like I play Fortnite and uh, the Warzone and the other day I was teabagged. It was terrible. Like that's how bad I was. Did like, it upset you? Yeah. No, I was like, what is I that guy doing to me? I, went into I didn't trouble realize. about that. I, this is like completely off. Someone got very upset. I like to teabag because I'm toxic. Maybe it was <laughs> probably was me. Uh, and someone got very upset with me the other day and was like, as a woman, you shouldn't be doing that because it's tantamount to sexual assault. Well, and that's an interesting one. That's so I don't I was like, okay, so I don't I don't ever want to I was like, okay, if that's how you feel, I apologize. Like I never meant yeah. to do that. But on the other hand, I was like, but you know we're playing a game where we're shooting each other with guns. Yeah. All like i d I'm struggling here because this is my way of having fun with you. Yeah, it's but banter, now basically. Me, yeah, it's right? banter. But now you've made me feel uncomfortable about everything i know about what to do when i play well so i think it's just sore loser like move on because uh, you die the next game reset you but know? i was like shooting people in the head so yeah, yeah. Now i've become i still do it but i'm just a bit more cognizant of the fact that it may upset people more than i know okay. <laughs> i didn't realize it because i mean i've been teabagged so much in games yeah. right it's just that's part of the fun it's part of the fun i mean it's just like when someone kills you in fortnite and you out and then you have to spectate them for a few seconds which is painful and they're emoting you know that they're doing it because you're watching so i think people just need to get over themselves and move on um what are you playing at the moment because you mentioned now uh, siege last night you haven't played for a while but i know modern warfare 2 has just dropped or it's about to drop but what are you playing at the moment and what gives you pleasure what gives you fun man 
So I have different, I play games for work, mm -hmm. which is literally I'm playing them to try, I either play them or I'm watching them nonstop. That's to learn the meta, to learn how the pros are playing, to get in there. I'll watch the pros play, then I'll go play a little bit just to get a feel mm -hmm. for, for what I need to do. There's games that I obviously work in a lot. I play them a lot. Counter-Strike, CSGO, sure. PUBG at the moment, the PUBG Global Champs are coming in Dubai. I'm actually going to be- Is that on uh, PC or mobile? These are PC, PUBG is Okay, so PC. I'm learning about this, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got PUBG Mobile as yeah, well, but the, the big okay. PC Champs, the Global Champs are happening in Dubai. I'm actually I'm going there to to host awesome. an interview, which is sick. Great. Uh, so I'm learning. I'm playing that a lot. Okay. I mean, I play that game lots, but like just getting making sure that I know what I kind of want to talk about when yeah. I get there, and how the how the players are going to play and, and things like that. And then I'll watch a lot of that. So like I will spend hours watching, just consuming, con watching pros yeah. play. If I'm not playing, I'm, I've got it on the TV. And then like everyone always says, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "My job." Yeah. <laughs> But then the game that I play for fun. So I, I made a rule about three years ago where I said there's got to be one game that you do not get involved in from an esports point of view. So this is the game that you never watch professional players play. You never watch streamers play. You do not read up about meta changes. You don't, you, none of that. You don't learn the different strats. You just are going to go in, play it with your friends and have a laugh. And that was that's Rainbow Six Siege. Okay. So the problem is now though my friends have got very invested and they've watched all the pros and like learned all the strats and whatever. So they get very upset <laughs> with me. But I was like, I need a game where I can just go have fun and I'm not, because I'm always constantly thinking about from a work point of view, yeah. like, oh, that's a clever spot. And just check if someone's used that and things like that. Siege is the game that I play. It's like a slowed down version of Counter-Strike or Call of Duty. Um, that's the game that I'll play. And I played a little bit of Fortnite No Build for a lot okay. recently. Yeah, cheapest. I thought the guns shoot like bubble gum. I wasn't the biggest fan <laughs> of him. But. I've got a feeling a lot of Apex players got into that sort of no build Fortnite space and were just sweats and were just wrecking people at some point. But I'm terrible, so maybe that's just my opinion. I no doubt they did. No doubt they did. Because that's, that's the thing, right? When you know that, like Valorant for me was, so Valorant is a shooting game. It's very similar to Counter-Strike mm -hmm. and like a faster version of Siege. Of course, we were all going to jump into Valorant and just wreck. Because there was a bunch of people who had never played FPS yeah. games being like, I'm going to come play Valorant now. And you're like, yes, you are. That's me. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our house, you know. Lambs to the slaughter. Yeah, like you got to do that. And I've been the lamb, so like, you know, <laughs> it's a good time. No, I get that. Um, out of interest, do you think these, but this, this sort of genre of Battle Royale is, is fading or do you think it's still pretty solid because there's so many different games popping up all the time and I'm sure you have a collection of games second to none, like, Labels so dropping many of games. That I, haven't or? Play, I haven't played. Like I've got so many games, I just haven't had time to play. Yes. So, what do you think the future of that space is? Is Battle Royale where it's going to be? Because Fortnite's been going a long time, but it's also lost a lot of people. Got people back. What's your take? So, I think games work in cycles, right? So, the 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 Battle Royale cycle, people love, and I think Battle Royale people love just because it was so many people, and there is. It's fun. You can jump in. You don't necessarily have to be very good tactically. You can just go in and hide and try and stay out yeah. for as long as you can. Battle Royale is fun for new gamers, and that was I think where Fortnite just got it right. Yeah. Obviously, now you're seeing people move to Ape Apex. Has got really popular because I think now people are comfortable in Fortnite. They've gone, in my opinion, to the better game. <laughs> um, and you're like, so there's like a move around all the time. But I think games work in cycles. So right now, I think we're, we're moving out of Battle Royale into the, the sort of FPS okay. team playing dynamic. You saw it got introduced into Apex. You can see it's starting to come into some of the Battle Royales where they're trying to introduce that. I think we'll get back into that sort of shooting game thing. And then, honestly, I think next year we're going to see like a, a resurgence of fighting games because okay. a lot of the new fighting games are going to drop. Then everyone will be back in the fighting game, you know, having a good time and then probably move on to something else. So I think it, it kind of changes year by year as to what's come out yeah. and what's exciting. Riot's obviously launched Valorant. Valorant's starting. That's where I think the Battle Royale will move into that shooter and then we'll move on to the fighting games as these new games come out. But that's what's exciting about games. It changes all the time. Yeah. But you can also choose your favorite and keep playing it. Fortnite was the one yeah. for a long time. I do think it's starting to, to die out. People are moving on to other things. But then they did the no build and everyone came right back. Exactly. So it's just how it works. They kind of, they ebb and flow. Um, I know for me, that's what happens. I kind yeah. of, I jump in. Like, I'm always in December, The camp, I do the campaign stuff. But if I play one of those games, I've got to, a single player game I have to dedicate three weeks to and no one must talk to me because I'm, <laughs> I'm not patient. So I want to start I got and finish. You. Yeah, yeah. So it's like my December game. Last year it was Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I played that whole game. I did all the side quests. Then I won't play a Great single game, play. By the way. It's phenomenal. Great I don't game. even like the Assassin's Creed yeah. franchise, but Valhalla, I, I had a good time. Yeah. I like being a Viking, it turns uh, out. Yeah, me too. It's <laughs> awesome. But the, the fact of the matter is, the graphics, the it's just gaming is on another level. I mean, 
Uh, Modern Warfare 2, I've early access because I'm a campaign guy. When I had a look at that, I was like, oh my goodness, because it was always like they couldn't get the mouth right. You know, in the, the dialogue and the cut scenes, the mouth wasn't right. They got it spot on. It's amazing. So it just excites me where potentially this goes, you know, and, and seeing the Star Wars franchise come back and how many games they've pulled out of there. And then you look at Mortal Kombat. I mean, how much Mortal Kombat can you do? All the Mortal Kombat in the world. It's just the same it thing. Just they just redo it, but it's yeah. just more and more gory. And, and and coming back to it, where a game like Fortnite can say during when they're raising funds for a certain cause, can raise $75 million in the space of a week, it just shows that gaming is where it's at. That's where the power lies. That's where the money is, not movies, not even streaming services. It's still gaming is is the apex predator, if I can put it that way. I think so. And I just think that you've got like this captive audience, right? Because everyone's playing games every night with their friends. You know they've got money to spend because they're yeah. spending it on games. So it is that. I think that's also why you've seen this like rise in popularity. But it's also an art form because like yeah. we're talking about all the multiplayer stuff. But there's incredible games coming out. Now there's one stray where you play as mm -hmm. a cat and you just run around and do like fun things. It's beautiful. Caters for everyone. It's a beautiful game. It's calming. Yeah. Uh, I played a game a while back, which was like one of, it was, it was kind of funded over a Kickstarter, which was all about this woman who, who she'd lost her dad to suicide and she was struggling with depression. So she did this beautiful art game where she you play as this young girl who fights these shadows. You have to get through like this town, this beautiful town that when these shadows come, everything falls apart. And it's like, it's an entire story about fighting depression yeah. and dealing with loss. And when you finish it, you're crying your eyes out because you're like, this is just, it's a beautiful piece of art. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what for me is special with gaming because you can watch you can watch a really good movie and feel emotional, but with a video game, like you live the emotion. Yeah. That's the thing. You feel part of it. You know, when you're running around in, you know, Call of Duty, for a moment you feel like, I know for me, I love FPS games because it makes me feel like a badass, you know, with yeah. a big gun. I know for a fact in a real life fight, I'd be running in the other direction. <laughs> like I am not a fighter, but in a game, yeah. I can feel it. In Mortal Kombat, when you're ripping someone's spine apart, just makes you feel strong and empowered. So I think that for me is the beauty of games is yeah. you can push someone into it and they can live that emotion even if it's something that they could never be in real life and that's an important thing for storytelling yeah. and that's the beauty for me that's always been the beauty of games yeah that escapism is just uh, it's unreal but i think COVID also has kind of brought us together in a way i know i interviewed you for a tv uh, story i was doing but COVID, i think has kind of brought us all together and like you said discord everyone's accessible now and your mates are like they don't even have to be in the same room I remember stories of, of Ray, who's the executive producer. He says he used to put his like tower on his bicycle and they used to ride to friends and set up the, you know, in the house and that. Now it's not different. Internet has changed the game. Do you know how many friends I have that I've never met? I mean, this is always, my mom freaks out about this. I have friends all over the world I've never met. And we just, we met through games. Yeah. Someone was talking about something on Twitter. We played a game together or we were like, we saw a broadcast together, whatever it was. And now, and they're, some of them are friends I would I would I've never met them in real life. I'd say they're some of my closest friends because every especially during COVID, every night we were online That's all so together, cool. sharing the struggles of like everyone in lockdown, no matter where you were in the world, talking about how horrible because we're all miserable at home, yeah. doing that whole thing, then playing games together, sharing that sort of emotional journey, <laughs> whether it was a good <laughs> night or a bad night, you end up becoming friends, and it has connected us in ways that I think we never had before yeah. and I think that's I mean gaming for me was always like that that was always I mean gamers I think the hardcore gamers have always known that but what was great about COVID is that like more people yeah. came into the fold and that's kind of exciting for me I've got to ask you something and this is out of left field forgive me but we there's there's obviously a group that say oh gaming is violence and gun violence is linked to gaming and all this where do you stand on this because recently on a few podcasts and, and audiobooks that I've been listening to research has shown that through various studies that gaming actually in kids helps their hand-eye coordination. It helps uh, the development of certain neurons and brain functions and multitasking and that sort of thing. But there's still this angry group of people, and it's a very big group of, angry people, big group of angry people, who equates gaming, especially the Call of Duty stuff, Apex, whatever it is, to gun violence. Where do you stand on that? So it's difficult for me because... So growing up as kids, my dad was, he was a big gamer. So when, from a young age, we... What did he game? What my did he, dad yeah, what did he play? Diablo, Doom, Lara Croft, Mortal Kombat. Oh, man. Red Classics. Alert, Command and Conquer, yeah. like all. <laughs> and from a young age, we, we, we weren't allowed to, like some of them we weren't allowed to play. Like Doom, we weren't allowed to play, but we sat, I remember sitting on my dad's lap and I could hit the space bar to jump playing Doom, which is about 
killing satanistic demons yeah, with yeah. massive <laughs> big bazookas, you know? Um, and I was young, yeah. but I think I had a parent who was very invested and constantly was made it clear that this is a game. It's not real, mm. you know? There was Diablo. We were never, I think we had to wait a bit till we were older because mm. that was like a little bit more. There was a lot of witchcraft and weird stuff involved in that game. Like, so he was always with us. I mean, we were playing Mortal Kombat. I remember playing Mortal Kombat 3 was the game that like got me into gaming. When we were like 10 or 11, we were ripping people's heads off. But I feel like because my parent, my, my dad was very invested in it, we, we kind of understood that it wasn't real. It was just a game. Yeah. And growing up, I think if you look like for both my brother and I, like we that that violent aspect didn't really taint us. And a lot of my friends who play games, not the case. But I wouldn't... I wouldn't write it off and say, oh, gaming doesn't cause that. I think that it can. I think that if you're in an unhealthy in an unhealthy environment, if you've got the wrong sort of parental advice, if you've got the wrong elements around you, and then you're playing a game where you're shooting people in the head, no doubt it's going to create a monster. Yeah. But I think for the majority of gamers, they're well aware that this isn't real life. Yeah. Like we're not. This is, you're having fun. You're shooting. It's cool, you, you know, but it's, but it's not real. I think that the small group of people that we've seen take it into the real world, I wouldn't say the gaming is the cause. I think gaming aided it, but I think that the cause was probably much deeper and more yeah. if you look at what was happening at home. But at the same time saying that, I'm constantly shocked by parents who come to me to tell me about their kids playing Fortnite because they'll be like, oh, my kid's addicted to Fortnite. You know, they're, they're playing it all the time. They got hold of my credit card. They bought all this stuff. And then I always be like, well, how old are they? No, he's eight. I'm like, why, yeah, why wow. is your eight-year-old playing Fortnite? And yeah. also, my favorite is always, do you know what Fortnite's about? Do you know what the game oh, It's just these cartoons. They dance around. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's have a seat and expect, yeah. you know. So I think that there's also that of, like, understanding what your kids are playing yeah. and being a little bit more. I don't think you should stop them. I know some people are very strict about age restrictions. My dad never was. But we were always, it was a controlled environment. Mm. He was always with us. And in terms of, like, playing online with strangers – that just wasn't done when we were younger. And when we got older, we had to play with him. Yeah. Um, and I play with, like now, I've got a lot of kids who will come and play with me, but I, their parents, I know their parents. I've spoken to their parents. If we play, like with my, the, some of my friends who play with me, we all know, like, okay, this kid's coming in. We know yeah. this is, you know, 13, Let's turn 14. turn it down a bit or whatever. Keep yeah. it controlled. Make sure that they're having fun. We yeah. don't ever want them to be sweaty. So I just think it's about parents taking a little yeah. bit more interest. So no, I don't think games cause gun violence, but I mean, I do think that they can contribute though in the wrong setting. Yeah, I think as someone who's an advocate for gaming, you know, at the end of the day, these sort of things are going to come up, you know, and it's something you have to deal with. Um, but when you're not, because you your hobby is your job, you know, and, and similar for me, it's difficult when people ask me, what is your hobby? What do you do to relax? So, so what do you do to relax? Or is it because you've got your Rainbow Siege 6 that you go to the game or do you so have you know a downtime hard, or? i'll be honest you know what's hard for me now this is one thing that i mean i think you'll understand this was my hobby this was what i did to relax now it's my job mm. sometimes now during my downtime i don't want to play games anymore like i'm and that's your a fans thing. are going to be upset and they know, i've this. told them like there's there's times <laughs> i mean I, I i went on a, a spree of like travel for work came home and i think i had like a month off and i just i was like i don't I don't want to switch on the console. Like my console, that didn't get my PC didn't get switched on. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to see it. I don't want to play it. I just, I need to be away from that, which is tough. And I think that's the the downside to turning your hobby into your job. Yeah. Um. But other than that, like my, it's a hobby, but it is also for work. I suppose I go to the gym now. I've got really involved in like fitness and this need to be strong that's great you're yeah. in great shape you're Thank looking you. great at the moment yeah i just want to be fit like this yeah. was, i was like i want to be strong the original motivation was if there's a zombie apocalypse i realized i cannot physically pull myself up so if i had to jump onto a roof to get away from zombies i cannot physically pull myself <laughs> up so this became that's my a thing. good starting point that was maybe. my starting point i was like if this happens i'm gonna die yeah so let's fix that um and that was why i started that but that's been really good for me because i think one it gets me away from sitting um, and that's like a, a hobby for me that's completely outside of gaming and I'm very, my phone is off and I'm not involved. Your time. It's my, that's exactly yeah. it. So that, I would say that's my hobby. I go, like I go to the gym once Good a day. Good for you. Learn to box. That's my new thing as well. Nice. Like, obviously all the Mortal Kombat. Um, you got it, exactly. Boxing is like, and that's actually like my new favorite thing. Like I'm really invested in boxing as a sport as well. Cause I didn't, I was, I didn't think of anything of it. I was like, oh, it's just a bunch of dudes hitting each other and women. And now I realize that it's really hard. Um, yeah. So I've been I've been doing the boxing thing now for like six months, and I've decided when I don't have work because I can't get hit in the face, I'm gonna spar with someone for okay. real, 
Because someone told me that you don't know if you love boxing until you've been punched. I hundred percent agree. So I'm gonna get punched. To see okay. How I feel. Yeah. All funny. right. That's well, my new hobby. Good luck with that. Um, and then maybe some white collar boxing. Who knows after that? You know, I was like thinking because there's all these celebrity <laughs> boxing matches. Yeah. So I was like, maybe I'm in there. You know, I I don't think I think once I get hit, I'm gonna be done with it because I'm not a fighter. You can say I've done that. Move yeah. on. Cool. But the fitness is amazing. The hand eye coordination, just learning that craft, it's it's amazing. But you know what's interesting is like there's so many. I obviously I work with a lot of professional gamers. The best professional gamers are very very fit, which is so interesting because you presume that they're going to be these really overweight guys drinking their energy drinks, eating their crisps. Yeah. Very like the best players in the world, super fit, yeah, I don't super think strong. People realize like on a on a twelve hour broadcast how much energy actually goes into it. I'm not just talking about mentally, physically. You actually have to. You can't be out of breath running. Uh, up a set of stairs and commentating or whatever it may be so I get that totally last thing before we go because we are running out of time and Tyler's already shouting at me um, what's next for you because the the FIFA stuff you've been doing well done man that's amazing uh, keep up the great work but what's next what can we expect so I'm obviously going to be in Dubai for the PUBG Global Championship which is a really exciting one that's their big one but for me I've never ever had a goal in my career I kind of have always just been like a fly by the seat of my pants type of person but I have decided now I really want to work on a major, a Counter-Strike major, or a, there's a, a series of events that are called the Intel Extreme Masters events. So I've kind of set myself a goal. I want to, I want to do an IEM next year or a major. And I think when that's done, I'm probably going to go and try to find something else to do. But I was like, if I get an IEM, maybe I say that I'm going to do one IEM and want to do all of them. But yeah, I think for me, what's next is I'd love to be able to say that I was a South African yeah. doing – one of the biggest events in the world. And then I, I just feel like that's really important. And hopefully with that, one of those big events will come back to South Africa because I think it's time for us to have a big gaming event here. So if I can get that done, then I then I feel like I've, I've done what I need to do. And then hopefully there's a bunch of new people who come in and take over. Are there new people? Are there people that you're coaching, you, you know, coming through the ranks? I see a few, but I, I think that a lot of people nowadays don't want to be... Broadcast is tough, right? Because if you're an esports broadcast... You're not the story. You're not, you're telling the story. You're not meant to be, no one, you're not, you don't go down in history. You're not the person people yeah. remember. I think with the rise of like streaming, everyone wants to be a streamer now because everyone wants to be the story and be the famous one. So I think that that's, there's a space where people don't really want to get into the broadcast side anymore because the fame side looks better. But there's a few people that I think have the, the potential. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can see more South Africans overseas. Yeah. But also for me, if we can get one big event into South Africa, like then I feel like there's a small group of us who used to do this esports thing in basements for mouse pads. So if we can get that right, <laughs> I feel like we'll all have a beer at the end. I don't even drink beer, but I'll have a beer that night and just be like, okay, cool. We've, we've done what we needed to do now. You know, we're done. Let's get the next generation in here. Well, Sam, you're a trailblazer, a pioneer, history maker. What else can I say? Thank you for your time. Keep up the amazing work and good luck in Dubai. And uh, yeah, we'll be following you on your social media channels and now TikTok. And TikTok. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.